Okay, I think that it's about time we started. Um, can I welcome you all here tonight? Um, I'm Sarah Worthington, for those few of you, but they're not very many of you that I've not yet met. Um, I'm slightly less new than Ed Murray, but I've been here since October and very pleased I am to be here. But more pleased to welcome you to another of these 3CL private law seminars, this one sponsored by 3CL, where we have Ed Murray, who's a partner at Allen and Overy, speaking to us on Did Derivatives Cause the Financial Crisis? A Practicing Lawyer's Perspective. I want to tell you a little bit about Ed before I hand over to him. Um, he is uh, Allen and Overy's global relationship partner for ISDA. ISDA is the uh, um, International Swaps and Derivatives Association, about which no doubt we'll hear quite a lot tonight, and a senior member of Allen and Overy's team, which advises ISDA um, on their global activities. He's chairman of ISDA's Financial Law Reform Committee, which coordinates ISDA's lobbying efforts with international organisations, European institutions and national authorities. He's a member of the Bank of England's Financial Markets Law Committee, currently chaired by Lord Hoffman, and a member of, the, of Prime Finance, the panel of recognised international experts in finance, currently chaired by Lord Wolfe. Um, of which Sarah is a member as well. <laughs> he... Uh, he could have gone down such a different route because uh, after he left school, what he did was philosophy at Trinity College Dublin and emerged with uh, the top degree of his graduating class. And then look what happened. He qualified in the US and in uh, England and Wales as a lawyer and is where he is. There's, bit, there's a bit too much is there, I think, in the background for him to give us uh, an unbiased answer to the question that he set himself, but he has promised that he will try to. So I'll hand over to him, and he'll speak for about 45 minutes and then give you time to ask questions. So enjoy. Thanks, Ed. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I, I was assuming that uh, once you'd heard the bio, uh, you would uh, know where I was coming from. Um, uh, but I will uh, do my best to give you what I think is the right perspective on the role of derivatives in the financial crisis, uh, or at least my view of, of the correct uh, perspective, of balance, I hope uh, balanced one, but I'm, I, I would be delighted, of course, if there is a discussion and if people uh, wish to challenge uh, my view or express different views, etc., etc. Now, um, you may know that Warren Buffett, um, sometimes referred to as the sage of Omaha, famous investor, uh, famously referred to derivatives as financial weapons of mass destruction, in his annual report to shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway in 2002, so quite a few years uh, before, in fact, Lehman's uh, collapsed. And uh, more recently, uh, the Nobel Prize-winning American economist Joseph Stiglitz, uh, in an article in The Guardian, blames OTC derivatives and specifically credit default swaps for, uh, if not causing, at least um, severely worsening uh, the behavior severely worsening the sort of the sovereign debt crisis, at least in relation to Greece. And of course, there's been, you know, there, you could cite many other examples of politicians, academics, journalists, and others, uh, lawyers, uh, even outside my area, uh, who, um, uh, you know, have uh, pointed at derivatives as, as, as either the chief villain or one of the chief villains in relation to the financial crisis. So I, I just want to look at that and, and just give you my perspective as someone who's been involved in the derivatives industry pretty much since the beginning of my career. Uh, I, I've been counseled to ISDA since 1994, uh, but in fact I started my practice in, in New York in 1985 and uh, began to be involved in ISDA working groups from 1986. Now ISDA itself was founded in 1985, so I was virtually in at the beginning of ISDA. And the swaps market itself had only been around at that stage about five years. So, um, well, first of all, when we're talking about, the, you know, the derivatives, uh, the role of derivatives in the financial crisis, it is helpful to distinguish uh, different phases of the financial crisis. And so I'm broadly speaking, dividing it, in it into two parts. Uh, one part is the banking crisis, sort of roughly 2007 to 2009. Now, I'm not saying, you know, we're entirely out of that, that crisis stage, but I think, that, you know, it's generally recognized that the worst of it, uh, the most serious, the most calamitous events... Uh, to date, at any rate, uh, we may have a further 
part, uh, of course, uh, one, one doesn't know, but uh, the worst of that was probably the, the 2000 to, 7 to 2009 period, and of course in the middle of that was the collapse of Lehman's in, in September 2008. Uh, but then also more recently the sovereign debt crisis, broadly speaking, you know, the last year or two uh, to present. Um, and as you say, you've heard my, uh, that, you know, what, <laughs> what my professional background is and, and, and the extent of my involvement in the derivatives industry. I think one of the reasons why, or rather the people who uh, tend to point accusing figures, fingers at derivatives, um, often are quite loose or inexact, uh, imprecise as to what they, they, they mean by derivative or what they think a derivative is. So I think it is actually important if I just for a few minutes go through uh, what I think a derivative is. Uh, hopefully when you um, understand the nature of the product, uh, it's a bit easier to see uh, how it might, uh, what sort of role it might have played in the financial crisis. And by the way, I'm not going to make any mystery uh, 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 of, uh, of what I think the answer to the question is, did the financial derivatives cause the financial crisis? I'll give you the answer right now. Uh, I, my, uh, my belief is that derivatives did not cause the financial crisis, but they did considerably uh, worsen it. In other words, they had an important role to play in the financial crisis. Um, so that is, that's the perspective I, I'm coming at. And I think it, it's important to understand what derivatives are, how they work, so that you can see what sort of role uh, they played in the financial crisis. And then you can get, I think, a, a more balanced view as to uh, the kind of role uh, that they may have played. Now, sorry if this is really basic. If, do you all know what a derivative is? Um, well, let me give you my, uh, my, uh, my take on it. I think it's helpful, first of all, to have the basic definition, which is a, a derivative is a transaction that derives its own value from changes in a reference value. That's the sort of, if you like, the kind of uh, a generic definition that I think captures pretty much all of derivatives. Um, and... Um, so it's a transaction that derives its own value from changes in a reference value. Now, the types of reference values could be prices of assets trading in an underlying market, either directly equity prices, bond prices, commodity prices, or via an index, because indexes, financial indices, commodity indices, tend to represent fluctuations in underlying prices. But if you like, at one, remove via the index. Uh, so you have financial assets trading, you have commodity assets trading, so financial derivatives, commodity derivatives. But you also have other variable measures of value uh, which um, could support uh, a derivatives contract. Inflation, freight rates, rainfall, temperature, bandwidth, etc. You have, you have derivatives on all those things. So that would be a topic for another talk as to how you actually write a weather derivative. But um, the key thing is that each of these types of transactions has a value uh, a commercial value, but that value is derived from the value of assets trading in an underlying market, in a sense, or, or, or some equivalent fluctuation in a measure of value. Um, now, that's the generic definition, but let's look at more specific examples. But before we talk about derivatives, let's consider the most basic type of commercial transaction, a sale. So, a baker buys 50 bushels of wheat uh, from a farmer at today's price of 10 euros per bushel for immediate delivery. It's the most basic type of commercial transaction. Now, uh, consider the exact same transaction with the one difference that instead of the wheat, I mean, it's, it's 50 bushels of wheat, it's an agreed price, uh, but instead of the wheat being delivered today, it's delivered in nine months' time. Now, the only difference between those two transactions is the introduction of time. Um, and... Yet that second transaction is a derivative. So, you know, a derivative, uh, it's called a forward. And uh, a derivative is created very simply. It's a very simple type of transaction, which is created simply by deferring uh, the time of settlement. Now, what does deferring the time of settlement do? It introduces risk. At any rate, it introduces risk if the item that is to be delivered fluctuates in value. So I'm, you know, I'm assuming that we're talking about an asset that fluctuates in value. Wheat prices go up and down. So for purposes of my example, risk is introduced because uh, the delivery uh, is postponed for nine months. Now, why is risk introduced? Because in nine months' time, the market price of wheat 
maybe above or below whatever the price was that we agreed, that the farmer and baker agreed uh, to pay today. So if wheat prices go up in nine months' time, who is the winner under that forward? The purchaser, because the purchaser's locked in a, a price that's lower, th by, by assumption, than the market price. And of course, if prices go down, who's the winner? It's the, it's the farmer, the seller, because um, the, far the farmer has locked in the price. Now, why would these parties do, do this type of transaction? They would do it because in nine months' time, the, the, the farmer knows it, it will have wheat, he will have wheat or she will have wheat to sell, and the baker knows that he or she will uh, have wheat that they'll need to, to get in, to grind, produce it to flour. I'm assuming this, this baker is kind of an all-in-one type of business, you know, grind, uh, milling his own flour and then, and then baking goods. Um, but the key thing is, one of them wants to ensure a minimum income, one wants to ensure a maximum cost. Uh, and they're both concerned about fluctuations in the prices of wheat. So actually, they're, they're both hedging. Um, uh, but it's otherwise a very simple transaction. Now, imagine the same transaction, but instead of the, the parties agreeing that in nine months' time there will be a delivery, instead, the baker simply purchases the right <coughs> to buy 50 bushels of wheat from the farmer at today's price, uh, today's agreed price, let's say it's eight euros per bushel, for delivery in nine months' time. Um, now, the baker won't exercise that option, obviously, unless the, um, the price is above, uh, the, you know, the market price is above the agreed price. And uh, so there's no upside, if you like, for the farmer. The farmer doesn't get the benefit if the, price, if the market price falls below, as it would do under a forward. So the farmer has to be compensated up front with some sort of option premium, some sort of option price, uh, to, to, to take that one-sided risk. Um, Similarly, the farmer might decide to buy an option from the baker to sell the wheat. So just the, the, the farmer says, in nine months' time, I'd like to buy the right to sell the wheat to you at an agreed price. Um, and the, so where the where person's buying the right to purchase, that's called a call. Where they're buying the right uh, to sell, that's, that's called a put. Um, hopefully, though, you can see that both those types of transactions are actually not much far removed from an ordinary sale. Now, let me round that off by saying every derivative is a forward or an option. Every single derivative is a forward or an option, or a combination of one or more forwards and options. Uh, well, that, that's it, that's it, basically. Um, so, in other words, at the heart of every derivative is a very simple idea. Um, so, you know, in other words, derivatives aren't intrinsically complex. Now, of course, if you combine several options and forwards, I mean, you do get options on forwards and so on and so forth, then you get uh, complexity. But the core ideas involved in derivatives are relatively simple. Now, let me quickly relate those to other terms. You heard, you've heard the term swap. Well, perhaps just in view of the time, I'll just take it um, as read uh, that a swap is a series of, of, of forward contracts. A future is a forward contract traded on an exchange. You, get, you have transactions called cat collars and floors. Those are variations on options, except that typically a cap, a, a cap is a series of uh, puts. A floor is a series of floors. A collar is a sort of combination of a, um, a cap and a floor over a series of settlement periods and so on. So say every derivative is a forward or an option or a combination of one or more forwards and options. And if you thought about my example of the options, you'll probably have realized by now that every forward can actually be broken down into two options. Because a forward is nothing more than the baker buying an option to purchase wheat and a farmer uh, buying an option to sell wheat where they've agreed the same strike price. So in other words, every forward can be decomposed into two options, which means that in fact there's really only one building block is the, which is the option, at least you know, in sort of basic economic um, substance. That's overstating it, because in fact, when you put the two options together, a uh, forward sort of behaves in, in ways that you know, individual options don't behave and so on. But it's still very interesting to know that you can decompose any forward into two options. Um, and if we had more time, I could give you some actually practical examples of my own practice where that, knowing that has actually made a difference. The other thing you sometimes get is you get a hybrid of a derivative with something else. So an equity index-linked bond is basically a debt security with an embedded 
option of some type, uh, or typically, or uh, forward. So it's sort of a hybrid. Um, now, one of the things to know about hybrids is sometimes people point to th those and say, that is a derivative. Well, it's, well, that's only partially true. And um, so one has to be a bit careful, uh, uh, again, as to uh, uh, you know, how, how widely we draw this, uh, uh, the, the set derivatives uh, when we're trying to decide uh, what sort of uh, actions we need to take to ameliorate uh, the potentially negative effects of derivatives uh, in, uh, in addressing any potential solutions to the financial crisis. So uh, another thing to bear in mind about derivatives is that a derivative is a financial transaction, but it's not a financing transaction. So if you think about the forwards, neither the baker nor the farmer was actually raising money. There's no raising of capital in a derivative, pure, in a pure sense. Um, so it's not a financing transaction. It's, it's not about raising funds, raising capital. Neither party is borrowing. It's about allocating risk. Allocating risk that the wheat price will go up and down, or bond, a bond price will go up and down, or an equity price, or, or, or whatnot. Um, so it's a risk allocation mechanism, and that's obviously important when we look at the role that derivatives played in the financial crisis. Let me give you some statistics. Now, these, I'm sorry, these statistics are a little bit old, but as a sort of ballpark figures, um, they're still fairly accurate. This is the, these, are, these statistics are from December 2010, and, and they're published by the Bank for International Settlements. Now, in December 2010, the BIS estimated there was approximately 600 trillion of notional value of derivatives outstanding at the time. That breaks down into 465 trillion of interest rate derivatives, so about 77 percent of that total is interest rate derivatives, uh, a further 9 percent currency derivatives, about 5 percent credit default swaps, less than 1 percent equity derivatives, less than half a percent commodity derivatives, and then there's sort of an unallocated group. I don't know what's in that, but presumably that's more exotic things or hybrids. Longevity swaps may be in there. Uh, weather derivatives may be in the unallocated bit. That's about 6%. But 600 trillion, which is a scary number, is actually only notional value. That doesn't, it's a misleading figure in the sense that the notional amount of, of say, a swap is actually a measure of the risk that's being hedged by that swap. It's not actually um, a measure of how much risk a party to that contract is actually bearing as a result of entering into that contract. The, the market exposure under the contract itself, um, if, you, if you compare the 600 trillion, the actual uh, gross market exposure, according to the BIS, uh, represented by that 600 trillion in notional amount, is only 20 trillion. Now, that's still a big number, 20 trillion. But 20 trillion is a lot smaller, I would suggest, than 600 trillion. So 20 trillion is actually the gross market exposure in the derivatives market. And then if you apply something called netting, which again would be the subject of another talk, but most of the market um, uh, have uh, netting arrangements in place either by contract or, or via the rules of an exchange. And here we're actually looking at figures for the off-exchange market. Um, but if you, once you've applied netting, the, the BIS estimates that that ex market exposure comes down to about three trillion. One of the things that I want to emphasize uh, about those figures is that the vast majority of OTC derivatives are interest rate and currency. And we don't really read much in the way of, of articles about the dangers of those. And no one has seriously suggested that those are in some sense um, at the heart of the um, uh, financial crisis. Or at least, you know, I mean, there are sometimes people, politicians who call for a ban on all OTC derivatives. And, but that would, that, you know, that sort of bold statement, that sort of bold demand would encompass, you know, a huge volume of vanilla uh, allocation of risk in the financial markets, which, um, you know, efficient financial markets suggest um, uh, adds value to, uh, or, or rather is, a, is an efficient way of allocating risk within those, efficient tools for allocating risk within those markets. But... The one type of derivative uh, that has uh, attracted a, a certain amount of uh, negative publicity is our credit default swaps. Uh, now, as I said, credit default swaps account for about 5% uh, of global volume in uh, at the end of 2010. So let's look at what, what a credit default swap is in a little bit more detail. A credit default swap is effectively a put option. 
despite the fact that it's called a swap, it's not really a swap. And I could explain to you, you know, maybe in the Q&A, why they call them swaps. They're really not swaps. They're, they're, they're actually uh, a type of option. Uh, and it's actually a put. It is the right of a protection buyer to sell corporate debt to a protection seller um, in certain circumstances. It's a contingent right, so it's a contingent put. It's contingent on the occurrence of a so-called credit event in relation to a reference entity. And a reference entity uh, could be a company, if it's a corporate CDS. It could be a sovereign, such as Greece or Argentina. Uh, it could be um, uh, some other type of uh, uh, asset, uh, such as a... Uh, well, I'll, I'll come on to the slightly more uh, complex example in a moment. Um, so examples of credit events uh, which would give rise to the right to sell, uh, to exercise the put by selling the corporate debt would be a failure of the reference entity to pay some of its indebtedness, a bankruptcy of that reference entity, or restructuring of the debt of that reference entity. And so with sovereigns, you have similar types of credit events, failure to pay, repudiation, moratorium, restructuring. The strike price of that put is the par value of the debt. The, um, uh, so what happens is Bankruptcy occurs, the protection buyer puts the debt, so they're entitled uh, to uh, get paid par value for debt that's worth a fraction of par because of the bankruptcy of the company. Um, and one thing I haven't yet mentioned, but probably should have and I will now, is that any derivative can either be physically settled, i.e. by delivery of wheat or by delivery <coughs> of debt or whatever the underlying asset is, or cash settled. Now, if it's cash settled, then typically that means simply looking at the market price, uh, looking at the agreed price, the strike price or whatever, uh, and then paying the difference. So in the, in, in the uh, Baker Farmer example, um, what you could have had is in nine months' time, instead of uh, the uh, farmer delivering wheat and the baker paying the price of that wheat, if the price were above the agreed price, uh, the farmer could just pay that difference between the contract price and the market price uh, to cash settle the contract. Uh, and of course, if the price were below the agreed, the market price were below the agreed price, uh, the baker could pay uh, the farmer that that difference. Which is one one of the reasons why sometimes the cash settled derivatives are called contracts for differences. Um, but economically, the two, you know, leaving aside transaction costs, economically, the two types of settlement are the same. They have the same value for the for whoever benefits, and indeed the same negative value for whoever uh, bears the liability. Um, that's important in all sorts of contexts. So um, the CDS market started off as a physical delivery market. In order to exercise your protection, you delivered the debt. But what happened when, a few years ago, uh, auto parts manufacturers and uh, technology startups, etc., started to go into bankruptcy, it was that the markets discovered there wasn't enough of the debt around to actually settle all the outstanding contracts. So those contracts then became cash-settled contracts. Um, and you know, cut a long story short, the cash uh, settlement price uh, was determined by an auction process. So uh, in those instances, the protection seller effectively just pays the difference between the par value of the defaulted debt and the um, agreed value determined by, pursuant to the, the auction value. So you can see how it, it fits into the category of a contract for difference, a cash-settled uh, cash uh, derivative. Now, a CDS can be written on corporate debt, so you have corporate CDS, corporate default swaps, sovereigns. It can also, though, be written on securitization or structured financing debt. And that is really where CDS uh, uh, begins to appear in the financial crisis. Um, and so in order to uh, explain how CDS made a bad situation a lot worse, I now need to say a, a few words briefly about securitization and structured financing. Now, strictly speaking, a securitization, neither a securitization nor a structured financing is a derivative, although they often involve derivatives. But you can actually put together a, a securitization without a derivative in sight. <coughs> it isn't necessary, in other words, it isn't essential uh, at least to a classic securitization, to have a derivative involved. Typically, there are derivatives involved, for reasons I'll mention in a moment, but you don't have to have one involved. Um, now, there are, however, something you may have heard of called synthetic securitization. Synthetic securitization does, at its heart, have a derivative. And synthetic securitizations were crucial uh, to the uh, worsening, if you like, or the 
um, expansion uh, of the financial crisis. But let's just look briefly at what we mean by structured financing or securitization. For, for present purposes, I'm going to treat those as synonyms. I mean, they're broadly similar techniques. Um, and maybe, again, during the Q&A, if, if, if it's people feel it's relevant, we can perhaps distinguish between securitization and structured financing. But broadly speaking, what we mean by that is that someone, an originator, let's say, a bank, takes a portfolio of debt, sets up a special purpose company, usually called a special purpose vehicle, an SPV, and then... Uh, sells all of that debt or that portfolio of debt to that SPV. Now, where does the SPV get the money to, um, to pay for the debt? It issues securities into the market to investors, who, and then it uses the proceeds of the securities issue to buy the debt. Now, this is a way in which capital markets investors can, ta can take on risk in relation to types of debt that otherwise are only available to bank lenders, for example, or other types of lenders. Uh, and it, that's why it's called securitization. You, you've turned other types of debt like um, corporate loans, student loans, credit card receivables, trade receivables, you've turned them into securities which uh, capital markets investors uh, can invest in. Um, why would capital markets investors want access to the, that type of debt? Uh, well, um, really just the, the, the search for higher returns um, because a, a lot of times those types of debt are riskier and uh, therefore um, by, uh, you know, they, the, the, the securities uh, representing that risk uh, carry higher uh, rates of interest. Now, the, what was the role of uh, this technique of securitization in the financial crisis? Well, in that in the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, that, that sort of period when, when things really started to go bad, and, and which that period is well chronicled in a number of books, um, but one particularly fun one to read, I suppose, is um, uh, The Big Short by Michael Lewis. Um, but there are some perhaps slightly more serious ones. The, um, you know, I think the, the general story goes that the real toxin that is at the heart of the financial crisis uh, was residential mortgage uh, loans made to borrowers in the U.S. on, ri on ridiculous terms, up to and beyond the value of, in many cases, of the, of the actual mortgage property. So that, you know, on any sort of sensible measure, uh, you know, money was being lent to people who couldn't, re couldn't repay it. Um, and that toxin was distributed through the financial system via securitization and structured financing. So a dodgy residential mortgage lender would accumulate a portfolio of almost worthless loans made to borrowers with no hope of repaying them. And then the lender would transfer all those loans to a special purpose vehicle. Uh, the SPV would issue securities, get in investors' money, um, and, um, and then you know, pay the, you know, in effect take the, these worthless assets from uh, the, the lender. Of course, I'm slightly exaggerating or oversimplifying uh, for dramatic effect, but um, I mean, broadly speaking, that is how to the toxin entered the system. Now, why would investors lend to such an SPV? Because they misunderstood and or were misled, misled as to the nature of the, the risks in that portfolio, because they believed that actually that portfolio of debt wasn't as bad as, uh, as it sounds. Um, but there was also a belief that somehow the structure uh, of the debt issuance um, alleviated some of the risk via a technique called tranching. So, um, how does that work? Well, in these securitizations, typically the securities issued by the SPV are issued in different classes, and that's sometimes referred to as the, as the capital structure. So, uh, there would be an equity class, and then an unrated, subordinated class, and then maybe a triple B class, a double A class, a triple A class, and then, actually, there would be a class above that, believe it or not, double, a triple A plus, sometimes called super senior. And um, it's been a while since I've looked at um, these precise figures, but I think in terms of order of magnitude, the equity bit might be 8%, un unrated subordinated debt might be about 10%, 5 to 10%, triple B, 3%, double A, 3%. Triple A, six percent. So seventy percent of the capital structure might be actually better than triple A, according to this structure. Now, what, what are these? What do these mean? Uh, what do I mean when I say it's better than triple A, for example? 
Well, the way the tranching works is that if there is a loss in the underlying portfolio, it's agreed that the party that holds the equity piece will suffer the loss first. And, the, you know, and only until the losses accumulate to the level where they equal 8% of the capital structure, when 8%, in the words of the debt issuance, has defaulted, only at that point will um, uh, there be any deduction from repayment in relation to the higher tranches. Uh, and so you... Uh, and so you roll on up through the, um, the capital structure. Uh, you know, the losses then hit the next tranche and then the next tranche and then the next tranche. And the ratings assigned to the tranches um, reflect the view of the rating agency that you know, the risk of the AAA tranche is AAA, you know, that the, the, the likelihood of default is very small. And when you've analyzed that bit, then, of course, everything above that must be then better than AAA, hence super senior. Um, now, super senior is better than U.S. government, at least uh, you may remember there used to be the days when, when the U- U.S. government was AAA. And AIG had masses of that AAA, uh, of super senior debt, sorry. Uh, and, um, but, of course, if the whole portfolio is bad, if, if your assumptions about the credit worthiness of the portfolio are, are completely wrong because you've misunderstood, you've misanalyzed the risk, then... In fact, you know, that so-called better than AAA risk is, is actually much riskier. And, and yet, because AIG purchased it at a time when it believed it was better than AAA, it gets very little compensation for taking that, that risk. So that was one of the reasons why um, AIG was one of the, first, one of the primary victims of the, uh, of the financial crisis. Now, as I said, there are no um, derivatives necessarily involved in a true sale securitization, um, because the actual debt and the portfolio I've mentioned gets sold to the SPV. But you can, cre- you can create the same thing synthetically by instead of having a sale of that debt from the originator to the um, SPV, you can have a CDS in there so that the originator keeps the debt but buys protection on it. So the um, originator, the bank lender the, or the residential mortgage lender, will get paid par if, you know, in relation to any defaults in the portfolio. Um, and, of course, then the losses will fall on the investors, you know, distributed through the capital structure in the way I've just mentioned. Um, but, in fact, the, the debt does not actually shift from the uh, originator to the SPV. Now, um, so that's by greatly expanding... See. Well, one thing perhaps you can see, one conclusion you can draw from this is that you don't, you don't actually need, you can write multiple synthetic securitizations on the same, on the same portfolio because you, you don't actually have to transfer anything. So that's one way in which you can, you can vastly expand the risk. The other thing is that, generally speaking, in classic securitization, there would be serious due diligence done on the underlying debt. Um, not sure that's always been true, but at least you know the, 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 the custom was to do proper due diligence uh, um, on the stuff that was being transferred into the SPV. But with synthetic, I don't know if there's something about the nature of synthetic uh, risk or not, but the, the, it became, you know, it, it just has became the custom for there not to be serious due diligence done. Perhaps we can explore why that might be. Um, so synthetic securitization. The other thing, uh, so, so you also may have heard of terms like uh, CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. Uh, a CDO is essentially a securitization of structured finance of the type I've just mentioned, where the portfolio, rather than being, say, student loans or corporate loans, is, are bonds of some types, debt securities of some type. Um, although you also get collateralized loan obligations, you get collateralized uh, bond obligations and so on. You get collateralized fund obligations, all those are sort of different types of CDOs. Um, and one of the types of debt obligations you can put into a CDO, of course, is another CDO. So you have a CDO on a CDO, and it's called a CDO squared, and indeed you sometimes get CDOs on CDO squared, so CDO cubed. Now, you, again, you can imagine if, if people are doing these slightly wacky things, CDO cubed, there's one layer after another between the ultimate investors and the actual risk that, again, seem to create this false sense of security about you know, that somehow the sort of, the risk was sort of just running into the sands, you know, it was being dispersed by these, this rather clever mechanism, instead of running straight through to AIG. Uh, but of course, in fact, what we saw was it was actually just a straight pipeline of, of toxin 
uh, of financial toxins straight through uh, to the end holder. Um, so that, you know, in a, in a sort of cartoonish sort of way, that is a sort of overview of, of, of how um, uh, structured sort of security, securitization uh, and structured financing were at the heart of the banking crisis. And, uh, the, and hopefully you got some sense, and, and, and if you didn't, hopefully we, maybe I can expand on it in the Q&A, as to the, the role that, that CDS played in that. But note, there was no role of interest rate derivatives there, no significant role that I'm aware of, no significant role of FX hedging there, no suggestion that those um, somehow contributed to that crisis, just CDS and only CDS in the context of structured financing. Um, now, more recently and more briefly, uh, we have uh, credit default swaps being pointed at and, and demonized in relation to the sovereign debt crisis. Um, and I, there, I mean, you know, many senior government officials, including um, Angela Merkel and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and, and others, uh, seeming to blame uh, the, default, the credit default swap market, at least in part, um, the this, this, this specul- so, so-called naked speculators driving sovereign borrowing costs up to the point where they could not be sustained as though there was no actual problem uh, with, you know, underlying problem, but just, uh, you know, a group of reckless, um, cutthroat, um, slightly malevolent speculators. Um, and even, you know, Joseph Stiglitz, who I mentioned at the, at the outset, um, you know, had recently said in an article in The Guardian uh, that uh, he believed that the European Central Bank uh, was, uh, to some extent, adapting its policy or distorting the policy it might otherwise have taken vis-a-vis Greek debt uh, to avoid credit protection on the, on the Greek debt being triggered just to protect banks who were protection sellers. And ISDA felt it should issue a refutation of that. And, you can, and I can give references to those articles, um, both pro and con, if people are interested in that. But I think just to highlight some of ISDA's responses to uh, comments made by Joseph Stiglitz, um, CDS are actually surprisingly transparent. Um, uh, one of the regulatory solutions to, to some of the criticisms of derivatives have been to require derivatives transactions to be reported to trade repositories. And CDS uh, was one of the first classes of, of derivatives to be reported to trade repositories. And uh, generally speaking, regulators around the world have access to those trade repositories. So um, they're actually transparent as to, um, you know, as, as to players and as to amounts of exposure. Secondly, the amounts involved are actually relatively small. There's about $3.2 billion in exposure uh, via CDS to Greek sovereign debt compared to a couple hundred billion uh, 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 of Greek uh, sovereign debt that needs to be uh, restructured. Uh, and that $3.2 billion is actually the aggregate for all players in the CDS market. So the exposure of individual institutions is smaller. And in fact, that, ins- that exposure itself of individual institutions would be marked to market, I mean, i.e. discounted to market value, and collateralized, uh, so further reducing the risk to the individual market participant. And then... Um, you would even need to deduct from those figures the recovery value of the debt uh, unless the Greek debt actually goes to zero uh, in a subsequent default. So the actual amount of risk faced by participants in, in the CDS market is actually quite small. So it is really unlikely that the ECB is significantly adapting its behavior out of some um, need or desire to protect um, a, a small number of CDS protection sellers. At least that's his dispute, but it seems reasonable to me. So the real causes of the sovereign debt crisis, perhaps not naked speculation, but overborrowing by uh, sovereign governments based on unrealistic assumptions about growth, um, perhaps reduced uh, receipts due to the banking crisis um, and, and the general economic uh, uh, problems that followed that. Endemic corruption seems to be an issue in some countries. I won't name any specific countries. Um, uh, but I, mean, I suppose it's, it's, it's something that happens all over the world. Um, so uh, now... Maybe just draw some quick conclusions before, um, before um, you know. Hopefully, we have a bit of a discussion. Um, I said that um, Buffett, Warren Buffett, talked about derivatives being, uh, you know, weapons of financial mass destruction, and the weapon analogy is often, often used in relation to derivatives, um, and that puts me in mind of. Section 1.1 of the Prevention of Crime Act 1953, which provides that a person without lawful authority or reasonable excuse um, uh, is committing an offence if he has 
with him in a public place without lawful authority or reasonable excuse any offensive weapon. And there are three categories of offensive weapon. There's a weapon that's offensive per se, such as a knife or a gun. There is a weapon that's, or that's, there's an object that's adapted for use as a weapon, such as a sharpened stick. Often those two categories are, are, are more or less the, you know, the same uh, or very close, closely related. There's a third category of an article carried by a person who intends to use it, that is not normally used as a weapon, but, but the person who carries it intending to use it for the purpose of causing injury. Um, now, I would argue that, you know, by analogy, uh, derivatives are certainly not offensive per se, but by implication, I suppose, um, I'm suggesting that derivatives can be used uh, for harm. Actually, I don't really much like that weapon a metaphor, though, so I, the metaphor I tend to use is uh, that of a hammer. A hammer can be used to build something, or it can be used uh, to kill someone. And I think hammers are much more often used to, to build things than to kill people. Um, uh, but the key point is that it's a tool. It has no, a derivative has no intrinsic moral quality. Um, now, we haven't had time to discuss all the various good uses to which derivatives can be put, but the huge volumes of derivatives that are done, particularly interest rate and currency derivatives, suggest that there is a serious economic utility uh, to these transactions uh, in ensuring efficiency, efficient allocation of risk in the financial markets. Um, so needless to say, my view is that at least one solution to the problems that derivatives raise for financial markets that should be off the table is banning derivatives entirely. I think that solution should be off the table. Um, and that's not merely my view. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, John Walsh, who's the head of the US Office for the Controller of the Currency, it's the current head anyway, uh, warned against overreaction. And this is, so this is one of the chief US banking regulators, warned against overreaction and misperception surrounding the risks of derivatives, um, which he feels could lead to harmful changes to the financial system that would actually be detrimental uh, to uh, market safety and, and soundness. Um, so I think there is the danger with, um, partly because people actually don't know what a derivative is really, um, uh, of overreaction. Um, and you know, calling derivatives weapons of financial mass destruction um, you know, raise emotion and, 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 and uh, uh, I think don't help uh, in that debate. So I I've attempted to at least give you my practicing lawyer's view of uh, derivatives in the financial crisis. I have deliberately not uh, tried to talk about solutions, but I thought uh, we might talk a bit about solutions in the Q&A or, or how, we, how we get rid of the negative aspects of derivatives, uh, if we can, or at least minimize them uh, while preserving the positive aspects. Um, but we can indeed open to questions or indeed talking about any other aspect of the financial crisis. So that, that, that's really all I want to say on the, on the main topic.